Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander is underwritten by Task Performance. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Voikovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Hey, New Orleans, get ready for some rugby. There's a new pro sports team in town, and it's NOLA Gold, bringing world-class rugby to the Crescent City. The game is fast, the hits are hard, the fan experience is for real. Season tickets, lifetime tickets, and game day passes are all available at nolagoldrugby.com. I'm John Goodman, and I'll see you in the scrum. But here's the bottom line. say that. Uh, let me tell you. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I'm your host Scott Alexander and as a born and bred New Orleanian like many of you watching this show, well, we're all in complete shock still. We all know what happened 48 hours ago. We've had time to digest what happened in the Superdome, the, the ultimate shocking debacle that went from an instant where it was going to be a huge celebration on Bourbon Street to a collective drowning of our sorrows. And of course, I speak of the NFC Championship game. I happened to be in the booth for that game. It was brutal to watch. Uh, we all know what would have happened. You can say all you want about the Saints shouldn't have blown a 13-0 lead. The Saints shouldn't have blown a 2010 lead. The fact of the matter is, if they make the right call right there, that game is over. Will Lutz never misses a field goal under 30 yards, and this would have been the Saints going to the Super Bowl. Instead, well, the Saints have to ponder it all next season. Uh, we all know about the play. Tommy Lee Lewis getting killed by Nikel Roby Coleman, robbed of the Super Bowl. And, but people don't realize how one bad call can affect legacies. Guys like Drew Brees and Sean Payton. You know, they're guys like Joe Flacco who've won one Super Bowl, who's not even in the class of a Drew Brees. Drew Brees would have had the opportunity to beat Tom Brady, just like he did one of the other great all-timers, Peyton Manning, and he was robbed of that. Hey, by the way, Zach Streif is going to be on this show, and we're going to talk all about it and, and what goes on in the future of this. We'll talk about that later. Hey, but the New England Patriots, they also won a thriller in which 31 total points were scored by Kansas City and New England in the first 53 minutes of that game. And then another 31 were scored in the last seven minutes of the fourth quarter and six more in OT. Brady's going to his ninth Super Bowl. He's looking for his sixth win against the same team. He got his first right here in New Orleans against the Rams. Uh, it should be interesting. Most of NOLA won't be watching, though. Are the Pels? Well, they won last night by 20 on the road without Anthony Davis. Now's the time to get it done. I also have the most influential person in the world in the second biggest sport in the world, rugby. His name is Gus Picho from Argentina. He's going to be on the show next. Tim Falcon, the owner of the NOLA Gold, too. The rugby season has begun. Football's put to bed. We'll see you soon right here on Primetime Sports. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports, and I know we're, we're sulking, we're drowning our sorrows with that Saints loss, and I'm going to get to the Saints in a second. I'm going to talk to Zach Streif. We're going to have a nice, long segment, obviously 12-year player with the Saints. He's going to be a Saints Hall of Famer, and it's the first year in the broadcast booth. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be enlightening, and I'm looking forward to that. But right now, 
Rugby season is around the corner. And when I mean around the corner, it is four days away. The Major League Rugby season starts, and I'm going to have Tim Falcon, the owner of the New Old Gold, He's going to come and we're going to talk about the team and the start of the season and how you can get tickets and have some fun with it. But right now, I was at a dinner last night and it was um, down in the quarter and it was a rugby table of folks from around the world. They had people from Scotland, Ireland, Australia, England, uh, Uruguay. Uh, and obviously, the, my next guest right here, he's from Argentina. And by the way, we're going to call him Gus because the way you pronounce Augusta in, in Spanish, I don't really know very well. And is it Pincho or Pincho? Pincho. P Show, but Gus P Show, welcome. Scott, how are you? Welcome, to pleasure to be here. Absolutely. By the way, I have to tell people, uh, Gus is 2017, 2018 was named by World Rugby Magazine as the most influential rugby person in the entire world. And right now he is the vice chairman of the World Rugby Organization. Um, and he is a former player. He's a four-time World Cup participant, two-time captain, they finished third in 2007, of course, that being Argentina. He's a 2011 inductee to the World Rugby Hall of Fame, and here he is right now. That's a lot of accolades, my man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot, yeah. <laughs> I can't complain. Um, as a player, let's take you back, man. As a player, people are, are surprised when I tell them in America that rugby is the second largest sport in the world. I mean, soccer has now finally probably gotten to fourth, overtaking hockey but for the longest time it was football baseball basketball and then they had a drop off it was hockey and soccer and other stuff but around the world rugby is second only to soccer right yes yeah, so rugby has been uh, and, and the last 20 years i think it grow it grew quite big yeah. and yes for, for many people that's surprising even in south america you said that rugby is so big around the world people as soccer mad fans, they, do, they don't understand it, right, but, right, right, yeah. but it is, it's, it's quite big, it's massive. You, go, you can only experience that when you go to a World Cup. It's just the whole world just collides sure. in a special place. So I've been, I've been very fortunate to play four of them. So That's crazy. I, I loved it, yeah. So you, played, you were captain in 2003 and 2007. Where were those located? Where, where we played go? in Australia in 2003 yeah. and uh, in France in 2007. And so in 99 and 95, where did you play? As a, as a we played in South Africa where the Mandela gave the cup at oh, United right, right, South right, Africa. Right. Yeah, the known picture. And then the, the 99 was played in Wales. Is that the Invictus picture? The, the, the one in the, the yes, 95, just, yeah, correct. I just saw that movie. And by the way, so you grew up in the country, and, and the people that follow World Cup soccer, you see the, the uniforms are reminiscent to the Soccer <laughs> World Cup uniforms. Obviously, uh, Lionel Messi is uh, the superstar of that team. They have a lot of great players. But you grew up in an era because there's one guy in soccer there, that we knew. The first guy in the 70s for me was Pele. Obviously, correct. everybody knew who Pele yes. was, the great Brazilian. But in the 80s... Diego Maradona, and that's the first name I think of because he's such a colorful, flamboyant personality, and he was such a dynamic player. But you had to have grown up, I mean, like I, I imagine most kids idolizing him in soccer. Yes, it is. As you know, Maradona and, and, and the soccer uh, world is it, number one. Uh, but you always, you always had soccer, and then you, are, you did other sports. Yeah. And my family was very rugby orientated. My grandfather used to play, my father used to play, my cousins play, my um, uh, brothers play, so <clears throat> he didn't have many choice. I just played, I yeah. just played rugby. Right. I played both, actually, but you played, I ended up you playing rugby. Saturday soccer, Sunday mm -hmm. rugby? Correct. Well, football Sunday here, that makes sense, the contact sport. I have to bring up something, I just thought about this, because my years in basketball, I've gotten to know Manu Ginobili very well. Yeah. Uh, Manu is one of the gentlemen of the game and one of my favorite all-time players. He brought the so-called Euro step into the NBA, <laughs> yeah. which I just call traveling, because they're just walking. <laughs> but the fact is, is that they get away with it. But I, I mean, obviously, I'm imagining you know him. You're around the same age. What is he like? Yes, yeah, so we, we had lunch, actually. He <laughs> you came just back. had lunch. Right. Had lunch, yeah, three weeks ago. He retired and he yeah. we met on an event. And I haven't seen him for a while. But yeah, we're in the same age. He retired last year, so oh, yeah. Four-time champion. Amazing guy, uh, very humble. He's from Bahia Blanca, a couple of hours outside of, of, of my hometown. Um, a true gentleman, uh, passionate really for the sport, and, uh, and uh, yeah, he's, he's, what can I say, one of the great heroes of Argentina sport. What are your thoughts when you come to New Orleans? I know you've been here once before. You played, okay, explain this. You came in 2000, mm -hmm. and you played in the first professional rugby match in... Against Wasps, yeah. In New Orleans? And Tim was the, 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 the chairman of, of, of NOLA. Was the Tim Falcon. Was the, 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 the owner. Yeah, and, and 
I remember coming to New Orleans and it was really hot in August of 2000. And, oh, it's uh, so hot uh, here, bro. Oh, I tell you. <laughs> it's hot. Argentina is hot, but here it was very humid. Yeah, humid. And we just, uh, and the story is that we, we left the hotel at five o'clock in the morning yeah. because the heat by 11. It's it so hit, crazy. It was so mad. And all the English players that I played with me because it was Bristol, I played on, a, on, a, on an English club. They couldn't cope the heat. Yes. And I'm usually, I said, well, I'm not going to leave at five o'clock in the morning to do some, some 400s. <laughs> and we were, and it was, and by 11 o'clock, we had to go back to the hotel to just sit in the, in the room. I'm going to tell you something. Because I, I, I grew up here, so I play, I was on, the, I don't look like it now, but I was on the basketball court for 10 hours a day. My, pretty much grow, <laughs> smart, every day eh? growing up. It's but smart, I got eh? used to this, you know, no shirt, just playing out there, and you, you're playing pickup and nonstop running. And then I would go to other cities and play friends when I got <laughs> to college, and they were in different colleges. And they were, I'm fine. I'm running all day long, and they're <clears> dying <throat> because you get accustomed to the heat. And then I moved away. And I came back and I'm like, oh, I forgot how hot Nobody it is. Hot. I tell you, I, I've been to a lot of, I traveled a lot around the world. I've been yeah. to every World Cup. The heatest, the, sorry, the, 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 the hottest pre-training session that I did in, uh, the hottest of all was New Orleans in August 2000. <laughs> Again, I can write it on the books of, the, it was like 50 Celsius. It was 48 Celsius. It was it's just mad. Well, I love this. This afternoon, you took a ghost trip. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I love, love that you're New doing Orleans. the tourist stuff. I love New Orleans. What do you I, think I, about I, the city? Because we love people that love our city. No, I, I love New Orleans. I lived seven years in France when I, I played also in France. Yeah. So, um, and in year 2000, I, I learned about New Orleans and, and I loved it. I stayed here for like 10 days. Yeah. And I love, and I said, I'm, I'm going to come back. And I, it took me some long because I just been around the world playing and doing and when this, came, this meeting came in to discuss about the promotion of MLR and how to work together, um, I said, New Orleans, there I am. And, and I brought my family with me, so nice. we're doing the whole nice. touristic. Ha okay, so you have, how many kids do you have? I have two daughters, and, and they, they, they love it. They fall in love immediately on Saturday. They said, oh, we love this place. It's an old school place. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's the most unique city in America. I know San Francisco is cool, Key West is unique, um, but, but New Orleans is from America. I tell you here, it's, it's really cool. The, the music, the food, the people, uh, yeah. the accent is different. I, I, love, yeah, it. I love it. Yeah, it's brilliant. Hey, so uh, oh, we went to the Saints game also. Oh, you went to the Saints game? Yeah, we went with our it whole was, family. It, it uh, was unfortunately. Tough, it was a tough day. Yeah, a tough call. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sport guy, and I was a very. I, a I don't like it when you lose. Uh, right. Right. Uh, it's fine. Um, you guys don't complain a lot, but when you look at that move and um, that was a, that well, was. Well, I'm gonna tell you game. this. I'm in the media, and I was in the press box, and I there's. I, somebody took a picture of me behind a, an hour after the game. There I am. I'm just, just Depressed. there's nobody there. There's nobody in the stands. This is an hour. There's only people there, workers yeah, on the floor. Yeah, and I'm just staring out and my engineer took this picture and he's like, man, you weren't, you didn't say a word for a full hour because I grew up with this and I'm not supposed to be in part, I'm supposed to be yeah, impartial, yeah, but, but, can, yeah. but I, you have to be from somewhere, right? And I grew up with this team, so it was devastating yeah. to me. And I'm, I'm imagining if it was a World Cup situation because they were, they were going terrible. to Super Bowl. Yeah, going to Super Bowl. I, I felt really sorry. We were all Saints fan around us. We were with our T-shirts. Nice, on nice. All the, all the, all the, the experience and. For that call, I, I felt sorry for the I'm going to tell you this. I, I was in Atlanta, but I, I flew back for the NFC Championship game when they won to go to the Super Bowl in 2010 for yeah. the ninth season. And uh, you would have seen a party that would have been like Carnival. <laughs> I'm telling you, because the French Quarter would have been just jam-packed, and it would have been people, just everybody in good spirits, nobody yeah. trying to mug anybody, <laughs> and it would have been crazy. That's why I, I'm just sad for the people that came down that have never experienced that. They would have seen something that would have been unbelievable. That's true. But on Saturday night, uh, to be honest, we went out to the French Quarter, and it was busing. It was yeah. brilliant. Well, Sunday night or Saturday night? Saturday. Oh, before, Saturday. Before the game. Yeah, because they were still happy. <laughs> Sunday night, there was some and there bad no, I went as well, yeah. and there was Yeah, nothing. the Bourbon Street proprietors lost a lot of money. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of MLR, Major League Rugby, yes. that is a relatively new thing. We're going into our second year. The seven teams from last year are here. They added New York and Toronto, and next year it's just going to blow up because you have Atlanta, Dallas, Washington, D.C., and New York, and eventually, hopefully, L.A. and Chicago. I mean, New York, Boston, and then eventually L.A. and Chicago. New York and Toronto joined this year. So what are your thoughts about this new league and, and Nola's part in it? I think it's, 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 it's great. I think it's great for for USA to have a, a professional league, to have rugby people in the league. Uh, no less, it's again, it's a rugby people's team. Yeah. And uh, I think they have a great future. And again, a team in New Orleans, 
He's brilliant. It's great. Hey, I have to ask you a question because when I, I was doing my research last night, we had dinner at this huge table. Like I said, they had the, the head of the, the commissioner of the MLR. Yeah. You had the, you know, Dan Payne, who is the Amer Rugby Americas I CEO, guess, yeah. CEO, and he's a fabulous guy. I sat by him. And then you had, you know, you guys, you had USA rugby people, you had people from all these different countries. Do you guys get together like this very often? Because this was a power table. It was like everybody's like <coughs> this, and poor Scotty's down here like this. I was just like sitting <laughs> you there were, watching. You were, you were, you, you were perfect. Uh, <laughs> that's what rugby is. Um, yeah. we, we like to meet. We like to understand how we can help. Um, I think uh, we, we had great meetings. We were here with all the World Rugby team. Um, and, and, and again, we learned a lot about the future of MLR. Yeah. It looks bright. Yeah. And, and again, all that support that World Rugby can bring to New Orleans and also to, to NOLA and to the MLR, we're here for because it's, it's not about only a business. It's yeah. a business, but also into the community, what things are being done. Right. To, rugby is a very special game. And, and I think for the community of New Orleans, having NOLA, it helps not only for the rugby team, but for the whole community. You know, Tim Falcon has obviously been the driving force to get, he's passionate about rugby, he's, it's a contagious. Yeah. I mean, I yes. had him on my show four <laughs> months ago and I'm having on again today. But, you know, he's big about not only the, the MLR, but talking about bringing hopefully events to New Orleans. This is an international city in a lot of ways. Um, right. what, anything on the horizon well, for that? Uh, well, again, we, we have a lot of, uh, from America's Rugby Championship games, yeah. We, we have uh, seven series that could happen in the future. I, I think, and I was speaking with Tim, I think New Orleans have something, it's a destination. Yes. And, and there's so many things you can, you can, you can do here and for the family, for the sport. So again, uh, I've been again surprised one more time in 2000 as a player, now as a, as a influential guy, right. if you can, you can call it somewhere or in the sport, I think uh, the future looks bright for New Orleans. I like New Orleans. It has a lot of character. I've been, I, I go around USA a lot, but character is the... Is it's, it, it's got character. Yeah. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not dogging Atlanta. Atlanta's a fun town. It's progressive, but it doesn't have character. And I love Atlanta. I mean, let me say it, but I love New Orleans. <laughs> this is character. I think it's it's again, soulful. I, I, again, uh, we love it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really, I'm not, it's not just saying yeah. the right things. I, know. I like New Orleans. I like the flair. I like the flow. The music, the food, people, that, that, to get all those things right, that means that there's a special time. I got to ask you this because <laughs> man to man, I'm sitting here. When you see, you know, your World Rugby magazine in 2017 and then again in 2018, name you the most influential person in the world for the sport of rugby. <laughs> I mean, honestly, what is that? What do you think when you see that? I'm not this sure, stuff? to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I, I, yeah, for an Argentinian to be so influential, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think, again, I, I, I just do things as I play the game. I give 100% and, yeah. <clears throat> and there's no, no shortcuts or anything. I just, I like, genuinely like the sport to be in a better place. Yeah. And I, I'm doing everything I can to, to make that happen. Okay, so talk about your, your chairman is in, from England. That's what I love. It's such a world sport. I mean, you know, football is football and it's passion here, but, and they play a little bit in other places, but it is American. <laughs> I mean, you guys, the people I was talking to from South Africa yesterday, uh, Gary Robert Gold, Robert, yeah. everybody else, but your, your chairman, uh, Bill yeah. Beaumont, yeah, is correct. from yeah. England. Yeah. What is that relationship like? Because you're in different hemispheres, and how does that different work? Ages. He's, a, he's a different <coughs> era, you know? I think he's, Bill is a great guy, um, and we do a good team. Yeah. He's, he's, he had played in the 80s, yeah. and he, underst he understands very good the core and the values and the organization. So I think we, had a, we have a good team. I like to be more aggressive, a little bit more, um, I think, uh, sport today, is, it's a business. And we have to take decisions like a business person. So we do a good team. I, I like to think that, that sport is values, but it has to have a bottom line. And I, and I like both to go together without disrupting any of both. What's your, what's your most memorable moment as a <coughs> player? I'm just curious because you, you play in so many World Cups and so many big events. You played internationally, professionally for several countries, France being one of them. But what, yeah, what is uh, the memory? I, I would say the 2007 World Cup, nobody, nobody <coughs> had Argentina in the best top teams in the world and right. we we ended up being third so that that shook the whole world Is and I was a captain of that team we beat France twice in France wow so the opening game the first time ever that that a team beats the home uh, team so 
was brilliant. I think they shock people, but their rugby gets just as many or more than football games. I mean, y'all around the world. I mean, I was hearing about Hong Kong and. 100,000 people. Yeah, I mean, sort of, this yeah. is, I'm trying to let people know in America that this is a big time major world sport. And how are we going to get this on the American map? Because it's coming. The MLR is helping, but it's coming. Well, we need to, again, join, join forces with World Rugby, MLR, the USA Rugby um, uh, people. We'll have to be here promoting you. Scott doing a fantastic job here in New Orleans. Thank you. Again, it, it comes to, like Tim was saying, it's communicating what a great sport we have joining us, everyone that, that can join us to go to the NOLA games here in New Orleans, just go and watch it. You will fall in love chance, with the game right? immediately. So that's the way you're doing it. Um, by the way, one thing, last thing about New Orleans and, and, and you know, in Argentina, I'm, I'm curious if you ever hear about New Orleans. I know we try to market ourselves, but you know, New York markets itself very well. Los Angeles, tell me about what New Orleans needs to do better. I think the biggest thing is just com communicate that you're a great destination. I think that when you listen around the world about <coughs> great cities in America, you go to New York or <coughs> excuse me, or San Francisco and, yeah. and, and, and yeah, they're great towns, but here you have so much more. I, I don't know, I like this town a lot. And they, don't, they, they need to do a little bit of job of doing that. Hey, by the way, this has been a treat, unexpected. Oh, thank you very much. I was going to have this mostly as a Saints show, but when they lost, I'm like, you know what, yeah. I, I don't want to drown my sorrows yeah. too much. We have <laughs> gifts. I know you have one more night. This can get you started. This is a wonderful, quaint little restaurant uptown in New Orleans, a very Excellent. cool area. I uh, it's called it's called Chaise de la Chaise. It's Chaise on Maple Chaise. Street. Okay, perfect. And you see Thank that? You. That's just a little starter there. That'll help out. And then this is you have you're going to experience something that I guarantee this won't be the last one you'll ever wear. It's called okay. Task Performance, a New Orleans company. But when I put one on five or six years ago for the first time. I started throwing rocks at my, my dry <laughs> fit. I started throwing rocks at my uh, my Under Armour Task Performance. Take a feel of that. It's bamboo oh, cotton. This is very soft. <clears throat> very soft. We bring that to Argentina and we'll, we'll, we'll make Task. a big deal. We're and done. how about this? You're going to put something in Argentina, your refrigerator, you got the MLR schedule for the NOLA goal. Excellent. And here we are, the opening game is on the 26th. There he goes. There he is. And pronounce the way you pronounce your first name. And Agustin. Agustin. Oh, well, I can do well that. Done. Okay, well done, I can do that. Peace show. Uh, and look him up, man. One of the great guys in the sport and certainly one of the great players when he played, and now he's one of the leaders of it as well. And speaking of that, well, we have the leader of the Saints broadcast. His name is Zach Streif. He's going to come on next, and he's going to talk all about what it was like. I was in the broadcast booth with him and Deuce McAllister. It was very solemn after that game, and a game which they pretty much led the entire way. In fact, they, they did lead the entire way. And we have a tradition here I almost forgot to do before I get Zach Streif and Tim Falcon coming on later. We have a tradition of signing the ball. I've had several rugby people, about five or six so far, and we sign our ball, and Excellent. there you go. But coming up next, we're going to have Zach Streif, and don't forget Tim Falcon, the owner of the goal, will be right after that, right here on Primetime Sports. Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander is underwritten by Task Performance. The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachaise, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachaise, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my, oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. Oh, my, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll. At Embracing New Orleans soul with style and fashion wear from NOLASHirts.com. Show off your love for one of America's unique cities with shirts, belts, and hats in a variety of colors and styles. NOLASHirts.com proudly celebrates the culture and embodies the spirit and determination of people from the Crescent City. The tradition lives on at NOLASHirts.com. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. Hey, I got to give 
Gus Pichot a lot of credit. He's Argentinian's number one player in the world. He's now the number one most influential person in rugby as vice chairman of the World Rugby Organization. Hey, by the way, we're going to still talk a little rugby later, but we're going to have a big Saints segment. And what better than a former player for the Saints and now the play-by-play -play broadcaster with WWL, the voice of the Saints, Zach Streif, is joining us. For the third time? Yeah. What's Scott, up, my friend? Thanks for having me. I'm uh, sorry that I had time to do this this week. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, listen, we all know. Uh, where, where are you right now with this? I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious. As a former player, yep. a guy that called, I don't know, I guess, 16 regular season games, four preseason games, two playoff games, 22 total games, where are you at with this? I, it's hard. It, there's no question about it. And, and I think as a player, you spend your whole career, and they're, they're really good at teaching you move on from a, from a call. A, a, a missed call, a bad call, you just can't dwell on it. You have to move yeah. on. But this one is different. And it's not just different because of the moment that it happened in. It, it, it mat it's different because of what the penalty essentially did in the game. And, you know, it's, and then you have to listen after the fact to all the people that have all these reasons why that ignore so many realities. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's hard. It's hard because you invest a lot in it as a player, as a coach, as a fan, as broadcasters. You invest a lot in it, and you have, you have an opportunity. And in all reality, you are about to walk into the, the Super Bowl, and it's taken away from you in a moment, and that's hard to deal with. Uh, speaking of the play, and this is the play we're talking about. We all know it. We've been seeing it ad nauseum for the last 48 hours. Uh, Nikel Roby Coleman. Just completely blind. So I'm going to take you back to the, to the broadcast booth because I was up there with you and Deuce and, of course, your spotter. And I remember vividly, we were 150 yards away. We were at the top of the terrace. That's where WWL is. You know, the, the TV broadcast gets to do it kind of in the middle. Right. We're at the very top. But I got to tell you, within a millisecond, I mean a millisecond, I, I put it all in my head. I knew what the time of the game was, about a minute 45. I knew the timeout situation with the Rams won. I just looked at that and I, I jumped up in the air. You're not supposed to cheer, but we are the home team. And I said, game over. It's over. It was that obvious. It wasn't that obvious, apparently. Scott, like you said, we're 150 yards away from that play, right? And I call a lot of the game with binoculars, but I've kind of learned with the Saints, I don't need to. And it's better. I can see more of the field. I can see a bigger window. So from 150 yards away, without binoculars, and again, you can hear it in the play call, we knew it was a disaster immediately. And that's a very hard thing to understand how we from 150 yards away can see something that seven officials can't see from a maximum of 50 yards away and at minimum five yards away. It's just, it's, un, it's unimaginable. It, it, could, it cannot happen in a sport of that magnitude in a moment of that magnitude. Well, I know that you, you know, had to go do a radio show last night. You're part of WWL, so you did the show. I know you heard a lot of stuff, but did you get to see the Zapruder breakdown, uh, you know, of the, of the play when it looked like the, the one ref was about to pull his thing out, and then all of a sudden he just decides to do the incomplete thing? Uh, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, because it was so yeah, weird. I know this. There's no way that those officials didn't both say to themselves, I think that was early. There's, there's no, no way. There's no doubt. There's no way. Not only and not only because of the visual, but the fact there was an audible cue to it. Because with the helmet to helmet contact, you could hear the contact before you could even see it. It's very plain to see. There's no way those officials didn't see that. One of the things I think is hard, and I th and I've always thought it was odd, is the crews are, have not been together all year. Yeah. So the guys looking at each other don't know each other at all. They met the night before. And I think if you put just a good crew on the field that's worked together, right. those guys are not worried about stepping on each other's toes, about invading each other's space. It's about getting the call right. That actually makes so much sense because I wasn't even fully aware of that. I know you get grades during the season, the people with the best grades get and they put together. But you're right. If you're traveling with the same crew, which during the regular season, I'm imagining that's mostly the case. They do, yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, you're not so afraid because, I mean, heck, I travel with a Fox crew. By midseason, I'm like, hey, I feel comfortable with this guy. I can make a joke. They're like, yeah, you don't feel like you have to make not make a call or make a call or if that guy gets it wrong you can overstep him um how many times have you seen a flag come in from 30 yards away right oh yeah all the time yeah 
And what that is is a guy going, well, I don't know how they didn't or why they didn't see it, but I'm going to cover this and I'm going to launch this flag from the other side of the field. I believe strongly in that moment, those guys are as worried about making each other look bad as they are about getting the call right. Yeah. Because there's no way, again, and that's what's so weird about this. This is not like a, a face mask penalty, which is like a safety, like a player safety thing. That has no effect on the play. It's not affecting the outcome. That, right, it's just like the Camara tackle earlier in the season. Would we have all loved to see a helmet to helmet on Jalen yes. Smith? Yes. Would that have changed the outcome of the actual play itself? No. Right. So let that play out. I'm okay with that in a moment. I can live with that. This was not that. This was a different thing, and it looked like a lot of people afraid to make the right decision. Yeah, they say 99% chance the Saints would have won. I think the only thing would have been a botch snap maybe, which probably never would have happened on a field goal that would have been in like 22 yards. Forget about it. But I'm going to say this. You're fully – you're you're one of the – I'm going to say rare, but one of the fewer players that stay with the team double-digit years – for his entire career, 12 years. I'm a guy that grew up with the Saints. They are my age. Uh, I used to live next to Tulane Stadium. I used to go to the games as a kid. I am fully invested. In the media, I'm supposed to be completely impartial. But like I said, this particular broadcast, the home team broadcast, I'm a fan. I have to be from somewhere. I root for this team. And there, there's us in the broadcast booth. But after the game, you left after about 15 minutes. Deuce left after about 30. And I was still stunned in complete silence and that's me looking at the stadium an hour after the game. I was just still like, I was just, it, it, nobody in the stands for like the previous 45 minutes. And those are just people that work there. I just didn't know what to do. And I, all day yesterday, I was in a fog. So I just want to ask you how you were doing Sunday night and then all day yesterday and Monday. The same as everybody. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. You walk around, I mean, you can just see it in everybody's faces in the city. And it's, it's a shame that it, that it happens. You know, I, I told my wife before the game, we'd had a really busy weekend, and I told her before the game, I texted her, I said, enjoy this moment. <laughs> How about that? Lake yeah. Pontchartrain, we were off. <laughs> they got it right. Yeah, Lake Pontchartrain got it right. <laughs> right. I texted her, I said, listen, enjoy this moment because you may never experience this again. Right. Because it's possible. There's, there's, so, listen, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, who have won a Super Bowl, have never hosted an AFC Championship game before. That's crazy. I said, enjoy the moment, you may never have it again. So to have it, and and decided in that sort of a way is really hard to deal with it just is and like you said i'm invested you're invested so much of the city is invested in it and and that opportunity to see another super bowl was taken away i hate to harp on it but i got to because this opened up the news the news cycle again yesterday besides obviously sunday night but every news i tape every news station and i, I just rewatch it and uh i was Every one of them spent the first 10 minutes of their broadcast just on this and the reaction of the fans and all that. It's just been nuts. Uh, where does this team go from here? I mean, this is one of those things you say, you, you know, how hard is it to get back? The Saints looked like they were going to be a dynasty for a while after the Super Bowl 2011, just two years later after they got over a little bit of the Super Bowl hangover the year before. They were just, just unbelievable. You're on that team. You're playing a lot on that team. But they didn't make it to the Super Bowl. That's it's so. It's a fine line between the best teams in the league. Where do you think this team goes next year, and maybe the year after that? Uh, how's the psyche going to be? I think for next year, it's incredibly promising. One of the things that's really interesting about this roster is the the list of free agents, the guys that can leave, is really short. Yeah, it's like you look at Mark? listen. Mark Ingram it would be a guy that we would be hurt to lose. P.J. Williams, after how he played at the end of the season, would be a guy where, that we would be hurt to lose. Um, and, and I think Alex Okafor is really the third one that you really – I like him. You know, Tyler Davison's a guy. But these are all guys that are not – Right. It's not make or break your team. Yeah, you got Marcus Davenport to fill in for Okafor. If you and I think, I think that this team – even – and listen, people will talk about the cap space. The cap – I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize to the Saints right now. The cap number is a, is a farce. Right. It's not a real thing. Right. It's a way for them to negotiate with their players. Sure. So they can make <laughs> cap space come out of thin air. Yeah. It just can well, appear. We've seen it for years. We've seen it for years and years. <laughs> exactly. So the cap, the cap situation is not, a, is not an issue. That's not a problem. Um, and this is still a young team. This is still a team built around young players. And I don't think it's possible for Drew Brees to say, I'm done after the ending of that game. So I think this team is set up to, again, be the best team in the NFC next year. Um, and you hate missing the opportunity that you missed, but this team's only going to get better. As a player, when you're close, 
Like, for instance, you were a rookie when you got to the NFC Championship game. Much different scenario. The Bears were home. They, they beat the Saints fairly de- easily. Uh, but as a player, kind of describe to us what this, what this means going to next season. Like, does it change your training? Does it change your, the, your the, how big is the revenge factor going to be? Because I know, we all know Peyton loves to have these little apples that he can use uh, as, as motive. Yeah. Uh, how, what does that look like? Every coach needs motivation, right. and every coach works hard to find ways to get the most out of his players. And in a situation like this, very similar to last year, there's a very easy carrot to dangle in front of everybody's faces all year. So you think about it. Okay, so what is the message going to be next year? It's going to be something like leave no doubt. Leave no doubt. D- there yeah. can no yeah, longer be. Was, this year was prove them right. And right? they did. Right. And they did 100%. They proved them right. They proved this year that they were one of the best teams in football. And quite honestly, I'm sorry, they were the best team in the NFC this year. No doubt. And the Rams were a very close second. They were. But, no, no doubt. but they, the, the Saints were the best team in the NFC. And so uh, they did prove them right. And I think next year, you know, as you build a team, and I remember in 2009, as those motivational things start to kind of stack up and, and you know, seize the second comes out of that season, um, finish comes out of that season, 2008, the Saints lost like nine games by three or less points. That's the po- yeah. And so these messages build up on yeah. top of themselves. And so they'll find a way to use that. Um, you just honestly, I, I, you just really wish that what they were doing is trying to find a way to motivate them to go back. I remember making a Super Bowl prediction of 2008. And everybody thought I was absolutely nuts. I said, I remember so many heartbreaking games, so many games that they had. And sure enough, that they were not, that obviously your own team, 13 game win streak. Yeah. Hey, I, everybody knows me knows I don't take have notes usually when I, on the when I do the show. And these aren't notes. These are Zach yeah. Streif's boards. And I brought them out on purpose because I'm going to tell you what. This guy, I got to give him some props because this is his first year ever doing play by play. It's the first time ever that I've seen a person come off a football field, basketball court, baseball field, whatever sport, and go into the booth to do play by play. It's one thing to do color because color is what you're used to doing. You're analyzing the game. So for me to be a part of Zach and Deuce doing this, this thing for the first time ever, and, and I'm just amazed at where you are at the end of the season because it was unbelievable the way you call games. I'm telling you what, man, everybody that starts on TV or radio it is hard, especially you have to come in and out of breaks and stuff like that. It's hard and people take that for granted. But these boards are one of the reasons this guy was a great preparer um, all season long when, when he was a player. And the same thing now, that these are just the games. He does this every game. That you should see how my, fine, fine print that is in this thing. Uh, how was it for you, man? What was your first year like? I mean, listen, it was unbelievable, right? Uh, the, the Saints, you know, win 14 games this season. And they're really where, a 14-2 C- team. I mean, we know that it would be Carolina's but right, if they cared. Right, right. And, and so the, the season itself made it very special. Um, the play-by-play role, uh, there's so much to it, so much more than I had a clue. And, and like you said, when you get into it, you, you almost don't know what you don't know when you start. I mean, you have no – you have no understanding of, of what is involved in it. And I've had so many people along the way. And Scott, I mean, you're as much as anybody really ha- has had an impact. I remember sitting in the booth in Jacksonville. Oh, God. First I remember you're game. sitting to my left. We go on air and I have no clue. I mean, it's like, well, what do I say when they're waiting for the coin toss? I mean, it's you just don't think about it. And we're going through that game and we finish the first drive. And I'll never forget it. There's like one play that kind of came out good. And I look over to my left and you're like, that was good. And I didn't even know if it was good or not, right? And, and, and th- in those moments, you start taking pieces from your season to say, oh, okay, I get it. I understand. That's better. This is better. Um, and you grow a lot. And, and you know, it's, obviously, it's an unusual circumstance. It's an unusual situation. But we, we've got a great team in the booth, Robert Carroll. And, yeah, Robert uh, was fantastic. And, and, you know, Jordan Fiegel, who, who does the spotting. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, Deuce, who I think – uh, I, I don't think I could have done it with, with anybody else. And, and our relationship has grown a ton. A lot of people thought we were like right, good right. friends before. Yeah. But we really weren't. We yeah. were eight years apart. We right. were teammates, but we weren't like Not much best overlap. friends. Yeah. We've grown together a ton. I think we both you know, have really enjoyed being around each other. And I think that's reflected in, in the game. And, and I think fans have appreciated that part more than anything. Good. Deuce admits that he was a little nervous, right? I mean, a lot nervous. He was yeah. a lot nervous. I just was <laughs> giving him a break. A lot <laughs> nervous because he's used to having a guy that's done it for 35 years that he can right. lean on. Think about that. 35 years and you have to replace that dude. I mean, 
everybody's like, wow. And, and it's so unfair to even try to compare somebody to anybody that's done a job for 35 years. Let's be real. And Jim is a special guy. Yeah. And it was so special on Sunday afternoon when he came in and opened up the broadcast. And I got chills right now, just yeah. thinking about it. I got chills that day. And then you two just kind of giving your, your little high five to each other. It was a special moment. You know, I, I thought about doing that for a long time this season, as we kind of said, man, this game might be going, this season might be going in that direction. You know, listen, Jim left, so it's good. Like we have a great relationship, Jim retired. So it wasn't like I pushed Jim out the door and it was this big disaster or controversy. And Jim's been phenomenal with me and and, and willing to help whenever uh, I called and asked him. But I thought it was important to have Jim be a part of that broadcast in some way. Um, When I talked to Jim, I think he was excited. My regret in it is I think that moment would have become bigger and more of a story had the Saints won that game. No doubt. And unfortunately, it gets a little bit lost. Um, But it was awesome having Jim in there. And it was very cool. He does his opener, or as he called it, the stage setter. And, you know, we give him a round of applause in the booth. And it was really cool. And and, and like you said, replacing him was not an ideal circumstance because he's he's the best. You know, he's an icon. And um, but at the same time, to have him in my corner, to have him be supportive throughout the season uh, meant a lot to me. And so it was awesome getting him in there. You know, it's funny. I'm just going to be honest with you. you. You hear people and they're like, man, Zach's really good. He's so much better than I thought he'd be. I mean, like, wow. And they go, but, you know, he's no Jim Henderson. I'm like, name me one person who's Jim Henderson. I mean, right. come on. <laughs> who in the city is right. Jim Henderson? Or who could they have got? There's nobody. Nobody yeah. on earth. So... If they say you're not Jim Henderson, who cares? I mean, that's, that's, not a, that's not an insult. Well, listen, I get all the time, I get, hey, I, re- I miss Jim Henderson. And I say, I do too, <laughs> yeah, right. right? Like, I love exactly, Jim too. Exactly. Like, you know, he, yeah, of course. Like, but listen. It's like that comfortable f- baseball glove you've had for 35 years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no it's doubt. like, yeah, I love this glove. No doubt. And, and you know, it's, one of the good things is so much of, of the way that I think about doing a game comes from Jim. So, you know, I do a stage setter. Why? Well, because Jim did a stage set. Right, 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 right. And so, you know, and I try to write it creatively, like Jim would write a scene, you know what I mean? So there's so many influences that you get from guys around the league, and I don't know if anybody more so than Jim. At the same time, I can't, like, recreate Jim Henderson. Nobody's recreating Jim. What you hope and and what what you kind of envision is in 25 years, the people who grew up listening to Jim Henderson are, are kind of aging out and the people that grew up listening to me yeah. have a similar feeling. And I think that's what was always special about this role was the opportunity to create uh, a relationship with the fans like Jim Henderson had, which was so special. And uh, that's why the job was so uh, fascinating to me. I hate putting you on the spot, but I just want to, I mean, is this something you can see going into for three decades or, I mean, what, what do you think? I have no intentions of leaving it. Um, I mean, uh, you know, it's first of all, it's a blast, uh-huh. right? Like we have a good time up we there. Really we do. really do. We have I ain't a, working for the money. You know that. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we have a lot of fun, right? And, and when I leave games, I have similar emotions that I had as a player. I get nervous before we go on. Yeah. I, I get amped up during the game. I felt devastated after that loss, you right. know? And so as a former player, there's a lot of things that I really – like about it it's familiar there's a schedule you show the cards there's a lot of preparation tons of preparation i like that stuff and so you know who knows you know what and and you know listen they may turn around in five years and say this isn't working and i may turn around and say that but i sure don't envision it Uh, i i would love to do it for for the long term hey um going forward uh we talk, we talk about the play of the game, but everybody, what about the game? I mean, because we haven't said anything about that. The Saints had a 13 nothing lead. I mean, we, all, we were all kind of like, gosh, we don't want to settle for these field goals. You always know field goals might end up biting you. But how similar, and I said this, I, I hate to say this, but I said it right when the interception or the fake punt happened. And I'm like, this is eerie how close it was. The Saints had, had been out yarded by the Eagles, 153 to 21 in the first quarter. The Saints out yarded. The, the Rams by a similar margin in the first quarter. And then fourth down play where it looks like all for naught, uh, 13 nothing deficit. The Saints were down 14 nothing the other game. And the fake punt on the, about the same part of the field, around the 30 of your own 30, that's taking a risk. And then pretty much not the exact uh, script, but it was pretty close. So in Sean McVay's career in, in LA in just these two years, they've faked nine punts. Eight of them came when they were trailing by more than 10 points. And six of them came on that side of the field. 
Thomas Morstead, who's a great preparer for a guy who's punting and you think he just goes out and kicks the ball, and Mike Westoff, who's a Hall of Fame special teams coach, are talking on the sideline saying, this fake is coming. So let's run safe and let's, no matter what, even if he blasts a kick 70 yards, let's make sure that we don't lose to this fake. And they got the, the, the jammer to turn his, to flip his hips. It was a good play. It, it was, was prepared play. for. It was, it was something that they, they didn't not know, think it was coming. Uh, they had the right call in the game, and they made a play. And sometimes that happens in football, especially in the NFL. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, again, that was, that was the turning point. It absolutely was the turning point in the momentum. If the Saints get the ball at the 30-yard line, uh, up thirteen, nothing. It's, it's, it's you said it. You, you never you know said where right it goes. after. You know, game over, right? Because there was zero momentum for their other side. I mean, they had nothing going on. That was the longest play. In fact, that was like one of their first positive yard well, plays, and it was in the second quarter. That twelve-yard pass was the longest pass for the Rams until two minutes to go in the in the in the, in, in the in first the half, pass, yeah, yeah. and they hit uh, Brandon that's Cooks right, on the right, sideline. Right. So yeah, their punter was the leading passer in in in, in terms of a big play. So yeah, it was a it was a huge moment in the game and, and unfortunate because again they kind of did all the things they could do to stop the situation. Hey, I'd be remiss not to say this. Uh, our owner, obviously, this is the year Tom Benson passed away and Gail Benson took over. I mean, what a special lady! And I'm not saying about what she did yesterday because it's kind of cool having a woman owner, I think, and especially someone that's so caring about her her players. I mean, you could tell she cares so much about the staff and the players in the city of New Orleans. And then she wrote the letter uh, to the commissioner yesterday. What are your thoughts on that letter, which basically, if you haven't heard, basically said what we all felt. But yeah. talk about that. Mrs. Gale, is a, she's a special person. There's no question about it. I think everyone in that building has a ton of respect for her. Um, I, the way that she handles herself is, is really special. And I think we're fortunate to have, like you said, a woman owner in this league, especially in the NFL, where I think at times the NFL thinks – strictly financially first and this is a game that wasn't built on financials it was built on emotion it was built on almost a brotherhood it's listen there's a lot of people on a football field there's it's a dangerous sport there's a lot of people involved and it's a it's a pure team game and I think it was built that way and I think Mrs. Benson is going to bring some of that mindset back a little bit I think getting away a little bit from well what is best for the bottom line might in the short term be best for the bottom line, but in the long term could hurt the product on the field. And I think Mrs. Benson will bring a lot uh, to the owners group in, in more in the way of let's let's remember how we got here and, and rather than the moment that we're in. And so she's a wonderful woman. Uh, we're, we're blessed to have her. And uh, I'm certainly glad that that she's around and, and I know she's doing a great job and uh, would have been nice for, for Mr. Tom to, to get to see uh, Super Bowl and his First year up in heaven. Oh, man, I'm about to cry. Well said, brother. Yep. I mean, well said. I mean, you organization guy now, 13 full years. Um, we still give gifts. I don't know which ball at the time, but, I, you know, that was so One poignant. Of them. I want you to get on another ball. But first of all, all right. you know the gift certificates we I love give. It. I love Shays, it. Shays, Shays. And, hey, how about the task performance? I know you I love and it. your wife That's love task. Very stuff. soft. We and do. here's what I do, man. Rugby season is here. I know. And I'm excited for this now. I'm I'm very excited for this. I think we're going to be season up. ticket holders this year. I was year. just at a dinner last night with some of the dignitaries of the world. I mean, guys that, that run the World Rugby League. I mean, I mean World Rugby, the whole the world. Yeah. And then you got the Americas Rugby, yeah. Rugby Americas, and I mean it's crazy. And this dinner had all these people, and I just enjoyed. They had like ten countries represented. And I just enjoy just talking to them all. It's a very cool sport, second largest sport in the world. It's going to be very cool. I think it's going to be great for New Orleans to have this. Rugby's been building slowly. Yes, I know it has. Ian McNulty, who's a friend of mine, is big into the rugby who's scene. He's going to be in the booth with me. And yeah, he's going to be up in the booth with you. So I think it's going to be phenomenal. I think it's going to be very cool to get to see the kind of in betweens between the Saints and and the the NOLA rugby team because I think there's so many similarities in there but i think it's going to be great for the city i hope people support them because i think it's a uh, it's an ascending sport in this country no doubt and i appreciate that zach by the way the opener is on the 26th which is this saturday at two o'clock they nice. play toronto they toronto and new york are just added this thing is growing and growing and growing so i'll give you one of these to awesome throw in your fridge. It. perfect zach i appreciate you we'll get Thanks, you on Scott. a ball yeah and i know we went a little longer than expected but Hey, it's the Saints, and he's my only Saints guest of the day, so I had to do something. Hey, coming up next, well, we just talked about the NOLA Gold. I'm going to have their owner, Tim Falcon, 
He owns the team, and this is the second year of existence. What a great guy. He's going to tell you more about what you can expect this weekend right here on Primetime Sports. Scotty says, I watch my TV show. Scotty says, on Primetime Sports. Scotty says, I watch my TV show. I got the Primetime Sports. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Primetime Sports. And like I said earlier, this was going to be a full Saints show, fully expecting that the Saints were going to win the game. And honestly, they got robbed. But the fact is, is uh, we had Zach Streep just now, and we had Gus Pichu of co- Pichu. Of course, he is the most influential person in rugby, according to World Rugby Magazine. And he's the vice chairman. But right now, we're going to go one more step with rugby because the NOLA Gold start their season, their second season in existence, and it's going to be this Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock at Shaw Stadium. We call it Gold Stadium. The stadium was built uh, in conjunction with Shaw with the NOLA Gold, and it's a wonderful new stadium. Come check it out. It's easy. Put it in your GPS. The tickets are very reasonable, 20 25 bucks. Gets you a lot. You have a VIP situation. But here's the owner. Once again, we had him on about three or four months ago. Tim Falcon. All right. What's Thanks up, my friend? Oh, everything. Everything. Thanks for, <laughs> everything. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> we'll talk about this, man. I mean, we're four days away. I mean, this is this is this is tangible now. Yeah. What is the difference between the opening of last season when it was the inaugural season, MLR, obviously the inaugural season of the NOLA Gold and in this season coming up this week? Just, just about a light year away, you know, <laughs> of what's happened over the, from three years ago when we first had the concept of MLR and we got together in, in Houston to get it going and having the first season where we had to get a stadium up and running, had to, you know, come up with logos and a team and find players and, you know, put them on the field and compete. And we did all that. And I think we, we, uh, we created a really great experience. The people that love rugby came out there and had a great time. And the people that didn't know about rugby that came to the games really enjoyed the experience. So we're excited about getting them back and getting more people out for our second season, which is this Saturday, we're ready to go. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna have a lot of bells and whistles on this one. And once you experience the rugby experience, you're gonna wanna come back more and more. Uh, You went out, you got yourself an Olympian on this team. I mean, you know, the Olympics brought back rugby. It was back in the day day in the early 1900s that rugby was an Olympic sport, but they brought it back to Rio. And they have a guy named Con Foley who played He'll be, he'll be starting at our uh, number 12, and um, he's got a couple other uh, real uh, South African, Tristan Blewett's here, and uh, Gale, Scott Gale, and so we've added some, some big guys in the pack. we got an eagle, uh, Cam Dolan, so we've, we've upgraded the positions we needed to. We've been really fortunate to get some really good uh, players and good people in town, and we're ready to rock and roll. And that's the thing, good people. I'm going to say this, and I love all the sports, and I think some sports get a bad rap because I'm around them, and I, they're a great folks in football, basketball, baseball, uh, and, and more than you think. I mean, I'd say it's 95%, but in rugby, man, the, 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 the quality and character of the person is something I've never seen before. Now that I've been around it for a couple months and seeing the guys from practice, and they're a unique blend, and, and they have a unique camaraderie. You just saw one of the most influential people in the world and how humble and, and, and kind-hearted and a true rugby brother. I mean, it's like yeah. 18 years ago we met when he was a player and you come back today and he still is just, just treats you like a friend. Gus Pichot. So um, it's great to have him back in town. But also our players are, are excited about meeting the fans and being out there. They love to interact before and after the game. So come on, meet them. They're, they're really special guys and they're really good rugby players. Well, we talked about him playing in four World Cups. I mean, World Cup of Rugby... Rugby World Cup is just like soccer. I mean, it's giant around the world. And to play in four is amazing. But I I mentioned the Olympian, but we were talking, they might be six, maybe even seven players on your team that could be playing in Japan for the World Cup coming up the next fall. That's correct. Two or three from the U.S., a couple from Canada, and then we got a a, a kid from Uruguay. And uh, so uh, we're really looking forward to watching them, follow them all the way through. Any last thing when you, before we go, because this is the end of the segment and the show's about 10, but... As far as the rugby experience for the fan that's never, ever, they don't know. A lot of people in New Orleans don't even know about it. And and I'm trying to spread the word, but what would draw them to a game? Fast action. It's a, you know, it's a two hour game. It's, it's, it's big hits, big runs, the ball's moving around. The the, the action doesn't stop. we got a great atmosphere. You can tailgate. we got all the concessions. It's, it's. 
it's a fun sport and it's, it's good to be out there and you know if the stands are full it'll be even more exciting so, and it's so going to be full us, let's fill the stands up, fill them up. and go. it's it's a it's an affordable ticket too I mean, even the VIP the experience. Kids run around. They have a good time. It's, 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 it's really a good time. Well, we give gifts here. I know you're, you give gifts yourself, but here, we're going to get you and your wife, uh, Shays De La Shays up on Maple Street Appreciate uptown. It. That's wonderful. And I know you love this task. You got one before when you are on the show, right? Right, but I think my son stole it, so I need another one. Well, there you go. We got this one. We're going to put <laughs> your name popular. on it. Like very we used popular. to do at gym class. They put your name <laughs> on so nobody steals it. And once again... You might have a couple of these, but the NOLA Gold Rugby schedule, I think they do everything top-notch with the NOLA Gold, and, and that is a testament to you, my friend. Come, come on out. Thanks, Scott, for everything you do. Absolutely. And it's Tim Falcon. Come support. This is our third major league team. Hey, like I always say, no offense to the baby cakes, but that's the minor leagues. You got the Saints. You got the Pelicans, and now you have the NOLA Gold. Let's get out there and support them. It is New Orleans. It's NOLA. And they got a great little logo, too. Hey, I want to thank everybody from CST and WLAE, Jim Dodson, Ron Yeager, and, of course, my producer. I could not do this without him. Will Hill is fantastic. And, of course, Naila Jones. She had some help in the audio room today. And, of course, the Redhead Tsunami. Keep your head up, girl. Hey, coming back next week right here on Primetime Sports.